Welcome to Europe PCR 2024. I am Flavio Ribichini from the University of Verona, and we are here to discuss the result of the SMART trial. With me, Professor Sabine Bleitziefer from Germany, the hospital of Bad Unhausen, and uh, my friend, Dr. Didier Cheche from the Clinic Pasteur in Toulouse. Welcome to this uh, interview. It's a pleasure to be here with you because this is a study that has risen a lot of attention in our community. So as good manners want, I will start with the ladies first and I will ask you Sabine to explain why this study was done and what was the objective. Thank you. The study was based on the idea that not all TAVI results can be generalized. We also know that from surgery that different valve types may result in different results. So the SMART study is a head-to-head -head randomized comparison of the um, self-expandable supraannular evolute platform versus the balloon expandable intraannular sapient platform. And it is also a study in a specific patient population because we also know that hemodynamic requirements may be different in patients with a small annulus of less than 430 square millimeters. Sabine, is this population something we encounter frequently in our daily practice or are small number of patients? So interestingly, so there are regional differences, of course, but we know in Europe this is a population up to 40%. And more importantly, this population includes mostly women. Didier, you have been the principal investigator of this study. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Can you summarize briefly which are the main results of this study? Uh, so, uh, to make it short, uh, 716 patients have been randomized and the idea was to uh, make sure that there was equipoise between both type of platforms that Sabine has nicely uh, described. So, uh, at the end, there was a stratification by uh, sex and uh, site and type of device and uh, 350 patients uh, in each arm were randomized. Uh, the primary uh, endpoint was a clinical endpoint assessed at one year, composite of uh, death, disabling stroke, and heart failure rehospitalization. And it showed a non-inferiority, it was powered for non-inferiority, equipoise between <coughs> both platforms. And that was a very important uh, finding. Uh, the second endpoint that was a uh, pr co-primary endpoint that was powered for superiority uh, was a more valve function endpoint. So uh, structural valve, hemodynamic valve uh, dysfunction. And uh, what we saw was a 32.2% difference in favor of a self-expanding uh, platform. So that was uh, the first time that we saw so, such a magnitude uh, in terms of uh, difference in hemodynamic uh, function of both type of uh, platforms. And then we, uh, as both primary uh, endpoints were met, we had the, the right to uh, yeah, hierarchically uh, test uh, several secondary endpoints, all powered for superiority, and they all met the endpoints, the superiority, with a p-value less than 0.01. So that was extremely in favor of the self-expanding platform, better a valve performance with the self-expanding platform with, for, for example, a, a point, uh, uh, five difference in uh, uh, EOA in favor of the Evolute platform, uh, a mean gradient that was really lower with the Evolute uh, uh, platform, less patient prosthesis uh, mismatch. Okay, so summarizing clinically identical results at one year. Yeah. There is a difference on the hemodynamic of the valve. Exactly. This is the superiority endpoint. I have gone, obviously, through the methods of the study carefully. Sabine, when the study was sized and calculated, the expected incidence of this primary endpoint was actually higher than expected in the, cell, in the balloon expandable, and even lower than expected in the self-expandable. This is probably because of the definition of BVD. I have heard comments of people saying, well, but we, you use VARC2, which is a little bit older than VARC3. Can you explain why this difference and which the results of the study would have been if instead of using VARC2, we would have applied yeah. VARC3? Thank you. First of all, I would like to um, explain which were the composites of this composite endpoint. It was um, a structural hemodynamic valve dysfunction defined as a gradient above 20. It was non-structural. Um, valve dysfunction defined as a severe mismatch or m moderate or more aortic regurgitation and it was also thrombosis, endocarditis, reintervention which were quite rare events. So the magnitude of the finding uh, we heard 
um, is based on uh, the gradients and the orifice area, which are much in favor um, for the self-expandable valve. And the reason why not VAC3 were, uh, definitions were used for the study is because they were not yet published when the study was designed and initiated. But uh, when they came later back to this VAC3 endpoint, they saw a smaller magnitude, but still a high significant difference. So the result uh, would not have changed if VAC3 would have been used. So this endpoint would have changed in terms of significant difference. Yes. It's a little bit lower in terms of percentage, but still the study would have yielded the same message. Exactly. Okay. Getting this message in clinical practice, Didier, you are one of the top valve implanters in Europe. And uh, so how would this result impact your clinical practice? Uh, that's a key uh, question, uh, Flavio, because all these trials are about uh, implementing them into our daily practice. And what we learned from SMART is first, for the first time, we had a trial that addressed the issue of uh, uh, female gender, 87% mm -hmm. of uh, female mm -hmm. population, and that was very unique to this trial. So we have now data about female and small annuli. And what we can say is that we, if we are dealing with uh, a patient with a small annulus, particularly a, a, a woman, we have to pay attention to the type of device that we're going to use. Then you, we have to match that with the uh, exercise capacity of the patient. Uh, is it a, a very mobile, young patient? And potentially having a better hemodynamic is going to be uh, helpful in terms of uh, daily, daily life, quality of life. And potentially in the future, we'll see. We have to wait for the long-term results, but potentially an impact on durability. We'll, we'll see that. But at least for today, if you have a small uh, annulus and you fear annular rupture or coronary obstruction or high gradients, potentially considering based on your exper expertise, a self-expanding platform makes sense. It has to be discussed. Okay. So more women, not because that was a criteria of inclusion, but because women have small annuli. Most of these patients have been enrolled <coughs> in the US. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The American population probably is bigger than the Europeans. If you put small annulus and big body surface area, the risk of having patients' prosthesis mismatch is much higher. Is so, that right? Yeah. Does this impact in a certain way the considerations when you advise or you consider a female patient for transcatheter valve replacement, Sabine? So first of all, it was really a very unique thing that um, such a high percentage of female patients were enrolled in the studies. Female, in the past, females have been underdiagnosed and undertreated and um, underenrolled in uh, major trials. So for the first time now, we have this information about um, the this, this specific needs of uh, the small annuli. Thank you. If I may, one of yeah. the of the curiosities of this study going through the results is the, let's say, unexpectedly high uh, level of paravalvular leak. It's mild, I mean, it's not mm. severe, but it's mild paravalvular leak. It's higher in the balloon expandable than in the self expandable. I mean, we all have this thought, we used to have, that balloon expandable have less paravalvular leak. 19%. How this compared with previous studies with the same Sapien and Ultravalve, did you? So uh, it's true that this was a key finding of the trial as well. And let's keep in mind that we are focusing on small annuli. So it's a different population, a, a specific <coughs> population. So as I said before, there are the major risks are coronary obstruction, annular rupture, and uh, high gradients. Uh, so uh, we know that with a self-expanding platform, we're going to seal. We're going to seal in small annulus. So, so the radial force is enough to, to, to make sure that you don't get any regurgitation first. And second, with the, uh, if you wait over time, there is a continuous expansion of the stent frame. We've seen that. Several studies have, seen, <coughs> have demonstrated that. For the balloon expandable platform, usually we don't get regurgitation. And we have to once again stress that it's only about mild regurgitation. Uh, my explanation of that difference, new finding in small annulus, is that because potentially there was a fear of annular <coughs> rupture when the randomization was for a balloon expandable platform, if you now with that contemporary practice of adjusting the volume that you put in the balloon expandable platform, in the balloon of the, the device, you may at the end of the day not uh, achieve enough expansion, the intended expansion of the, uh, of the, the TAVI device. 
This combined with a potentially recoil of the cobalt chromium, this could explain that higher rate of uh, mild regurgitation in a balloon expandable platform. So it makes sense to me, in fact, because it's contemporary practice once again. If we uh, say put the maximum volume uh, for your balloon expandable platform, potentially the results would have been different at the cost of a potentially higher risk of annular rupture. So I think it's, it reflects contemporary I, practice. I see your point, but this brings me another question. I mean, yeah. Uh, operators might be, I mean, it's, it's the worst complication we may have, it's an adrenal raptor. So you, you say, we have been very careful not to have this, and indeed didn't happen in the study. But expert operators, they dared a little bit more. I mean, the centers that were selected were more used to implant self-expandable no. than Le sapient al 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 because Yeah, allow me to fully disagree with that and to make it clear. Because I've heard some comments like uh, um, the vast majority of the patients were implant, you, uh, implanted in, the, in Europe. In fact, they were implanted in the US. And in Europe, only high volume exper experience the TAVI centers were uh, part of the studies as my center. So uh, allow me to, uh, <laughs> to expect s uh, similar outcomes with a self-expanding platform and a balloon expandable valve. Well, if I may reinforce this concept, we participated with many patients and we had a center implanting 50 and 50% 50 yeah. of two valves. Okay. Thank you very much. We are running out of time, but I think that this 10 minutes discussion, we went quite in deep. The objective of this meeting is to stimulate our colleagues to know about the results and to go and read the details of the paper that has been recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And of course, remember, we want to see the long-term clinical outcomes of this study, which is a pre-specified endpoint at five years to learn whether these hemodynamic immediate differences may translate in a clinical difference that was not apparent at one year. Thank, Thank you, you, Sabine. Thank Pleasure. you, Didier.